Uh, well, good morning, everyone. And oh, well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we actually almost have the room packed, which, <laughs> which actually is no more than uh, about 10. So, but again, thank you very much for joining us today for our 194th Coffee and Conversation. And again, we're, I'll stand off to the side. Can you still see me all right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're so fortunate today to have Tracy back with us. Uh, Tracy's been a, uh, quite a, an excellent speaker for us on, I think, four occasions now uh, and things. And we have a, a somewhat of a different topic today, but one which has great interest to Perry. And for any of us who actually have driven out to Breckenridge along I-70, who have actually passed by this site many times and just have never known it. So anyway, this will be, a, I think, a marvelous talk. Uh, a little, just a couple items I'd like to highlight of our upcoming uh, events is on the 11th of November, Veterans Day. You probably saw on one of the slides here, uh, we're going to have a very special commemoration of Veterans Day, including both outdoor uh, kind of presentations and then for the rest of the day, an open house uh, for visitors and refreshments and probably a whole series of different things. Uh, check out our website for additional information. And then 14 November, Ryan Wolf will join us again. Ryan's a former Army officer, served in Afghanistan with the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, and is quite interested in his history. And he's going to come back to talk to us about the historically important topic of how the World War I armistice shaped our modern world. And again, Veterans Day is a direct outgrowth of what we called Armistice Day. Uh, just as a couple brief background on Tracy, uh, he was a National Transportation Safety Board member. Well, besides his Air Force service, which certainly was important, and that got him interested. Uh, well, he was with the Air Force. You know, for those of us who are in the Navy, they're the ones who kind of are there to support us. But anyway, uh, following his service with cool the Air Force, oh. yeah, normally they'd miss whatever they're going to drop their bombs on. But anyway, Tracy was a member of the National Transportation Safety Board uh, in 1981, and that was involving a study, well, an investigation of a mid-air accident in Loveland. Uh, he was awarded the FAA's Wilbur and Orville Wright Master Pilot Award for 50 years of accident-free flying, and that's quite an accomplishment to still be living after that. He's been a flight instructor on multi and single and single instrument and float plane. Float planes? Wow. And he was an air traffic controller and instructor for many years. So again, without further ado, Tracy, thank you very much for joining us. And we're ready to go. All right. Don't forget your ma your mask. Oh yes. Excuse me. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I am glad to be here. In fact, I'm kind of glad to be anywhere uh, anymore. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And in keeping with the political season, let me just say that my name is Tracy Perry, and, uh, and I approve everything that Mike said. I uh, always have to do a little disclaimer first when I get into these, because I've got all kinds of pictures and all kinds of information off of the internet. And for those of you that don't know, everything that you read on the internet is not necessarily true. So you have to go through, pick the articles, find the information that you need, kind of weed through it, take the good, throw out the other, because anybody can put something on there. So in uh, October of 1970, the uh, Wichita State uh, Shockers were supposed to go to uh, Logan, Utah and play the Utah State Aggies uh, in football. 
The Shockers, let me explain that, how they got that name. Uh, Kansas raises a lot of wheat, and when you cut the wheat down in the old days, you cut it down low, wrapped it up with a piece of twine or something, and those were called shocks. So the guys that did that were called shockers. So that's where they came up with their, uh, their school, school name. It was uh, about a thousand miles from Wichita over to Logan, Utah. And they considered buses, probably three buses to haul the football team and the coaches and uh, some booster folks. And if they did that in a day, the team would probably be exhausted. So they decided maybe the best thing to do would be to charter an airplane. And this is what they had in mind. A DC-6B built by Douglas, uh, holds 100 passengers, uh, four engines, a lot of fuel. They could have done Logan nonstop without any problem. And it would have held everybody that wanted to go. But it had some wind damage, so it was out of service and unable to go. So Golden Eagle, the uh, company that they were going to have do their flying for them, they were in Oklahoma City, and they suggested two airplanes. And the ones that they selected was the, uh, the Martin 404, uh, twin engine. Uh, that's not a good picture there. Go back to this one. Uh, twin engine. 2,400 uh, 2, uh, horsepower per engine. And I got some of these uh, figures for you. 312 miles an hour, a thousand mile range, which would have taken them to Logan without any problem, uh, except that uh, they only had enough fuel for about 500 miles. Built in 1950, uh, maximum takeoff 44.9, Service ceiling, 29,000 feet. And I thought that was, I thought that looked like something that might have come out of marketing. Uh, I think the airplane probably would have gotten to 29,000 feet, but not with any seats in the back, not with any people in the back, two people up front, a light load of fuel, and half a day to climb up there. But that's what they put out. It was topped off with uh, 2,000 gallons of fuel, 1,000 in each wing, and an extra 12,400 pounds for all of that fuel. It had no flight data recorder and no cockpit voice recorder, and they were not required in that airplane. The school, their colors were black and gold. So it was just natural that they would name these two flights, the black, black flight and the gold flight. The black flight was the one that made it all the way to Logan, and the gold flight is the one that we'll talk about today. This was the co-pilot. His name was Dan Crocker. And uh, I'm sorry, Ron Skipper. The captain was uh, Dan Crocker, which one website said he was the president of Golden Eagle uh, Charter Company, and there was no indication that the crew had got together and talked about before they took off who was going to be pilot in command. And I've always found that to be very, very important, especially when I fly with somebody and, and Bill flown with him a lot. We always talked about before we got on the airplane and took off, who's going to be pilot in command? Who's responsible? And it has to be pinned down to one person. There's no indication that they ever decided who was going to be the, uh, the pilot in command. Uh, this guy was in the right seat, Skipper, and uh, Crocker was in the left seat. So there might have been an assumption that if you're in the left seat, you're pilot in command. Not necessarily true. This is what they had planned, two airplanes, formation flight to uh, Stapleton in Denver. And then after refueling up to uh, Laramie and turn the corner and go to uh, Logan. That would have uh, allowed them to fly the whole route between eight and 10,000 feet. And uh, basically from Laramie Interstate 80 all, over to, all the way over to Logan. So it would have been uh, uh, a doable flight, not any problem at all. They didn't 
And uh, in a formation flight, it may have been one of those uh, Navy formation flights that you may have heard of. Um, it was The Navy called it a summer formation. And they called it that because summer back there and summer over here, summer up above. Uh, Navy Mike. formation is the same sky, same day, same morning. <laughs> yeah. I hope you caught that, Mike, wherever you are. He probably went home. Blue Angels aren't going to like that. <laughs> Hey, what, what time of year was this, October? October. October the 2nd is when they took off. Uh, 9 o'clock formation flight over to uh, Stapleton. 520 miles, and then it would be another 570 miles on over to Logan. Uh, the load, normally they figure the load at 170 pounds per person. Uh, there's been a couple of times that that has not worked at all. Uh, I'll just mention a DC-8 years ago from Honolulu to Saigon uh, during the Vietnam War. Had a full load going over. They got off of the ground, climbed about 15 or 20 feet. The airplane ceased flying higher. It wouldn't climb. So they leveled it off and flew in ground effect out over the ocean until they finally got light enough to climb up. What they found out is that they had figured all of these people on there at 170 pounds apiece except they were all combat-ready GIs. Every one of them had a duffel bag and all of their equipment and weapons and ammunition and helmets and everything else uh, was grossly overloaded, and luckily it flew. So 170 pounds wouldn't necessarily uh, take care of all of that. 170 is a good average. You've got a baby that weighs almost nothing and the fat guy that always sits next to you that uh, passes gas and is smelly and everything, you've probably been with him. Football players, they figured probably afterwards uh, at least 200 pounds apiece, uh, college kids, uh, 40 people all together. Uh, at 170 pounds, that would have been 6,800 feet, or 6,800 pounds. Uh, 14 players at 200 plus, that's an extra 420 pounds there. Uh, I found on the internet that uh, football equipment is about 20 pounds per person. So that put another 280 pounds on there and 12,400 pounds of fuel. And uh, that's all going to come into play as we get on with the presentation. Skipper, I'll back the for just a minute. Skipper bought a sectional chart in Denver, and this has an awful lot of information on it. There's what it says, Denver. Uh, I'm going to show you this. It's going to be hard to see, but I've got a couple of slides up here. Just to show you that something would have helped them out a lot. They bought the sectional chart, but they did not have time to go over it and review it and look at it. They didn't talk to anybody else in the local area. And at Denver, there's always pilots hanging around that have flown the mountains and have some good knowledge. Never talk to any of those folks. Out here on the eastern edge of uh, Denver, it's a light, light tan. As you go further to the west, the, the terrain goes up and the color turns a little more brown. So that when you get over here near where the accident happens, here's a range of mountains that you can see is a different color of brown. So that could have been their first indication if they just just taken a look at this and had somebody talk to them about this canyon. It turned out to be a completely blind canyon. So here is the sectional chart. The yellow is Denver, the uh, metropolitan area. Here's Idaho Springs. And this shows inter Interstate 70 going up, Georgetown. Uh, I'm sorry, this is 70. Georgetown, the way they went. And over here is that bowl. And if you look close, you may not be able to see it, but this is 13,500. This one here is 13,200. There's another one here that's 13,000. And this little notch here is Loveland Pass, and it's right at 12,000 feet. So it doesn't take long to take a look at that and say, okay, 
what is my out? What do I do if I can't climb uh, to get enough altitude to go over? And the lowest place to go over is Loveland Pass. 12,990 feet. So all they had to do was take a quick look at that. And that might have changed their mind. There's no indication that, it, that they talked to the other two pilots that flew up over Laramie. Uh, and they didn't even know that these guys were going to go out and take the scenic route. Yeah, why, that's what I'm saying. Why did they change, change up and do this? Scenic route? Yeah, and that was the only reason for it uh, as, that I could find on the Internet. They just wanted to be able to point out things. It was one of the reasons that Skipper bought the sectional because he could see these things on the map and then point it out as they went by. So no time to study that. They got off of uh, uh, Stapleton, uh, 5,300 feet is the, was the elevation at the airport. There's no indication that they leaned the engines for that altitude or for any higher altitude to get the maximum amount of horsepower out of those two engines. They're probably thinking a big airplane Five, almost 5,000 horsepower, it'll go anywhere. And the information that they had, the service ceiling on it was 29,000 feet. Piece of cake. Had they had any experience flying in altitude? They there was no indication that they had ever had uh, any mountain checkout or any information about mountains. Uh, there were a lot of things that you have to, st to study to get a private license anywhere, and one of them is density altitude. And I always told my students that the, the briefest definition of density altitude is the altitude that the airplane thinks it's at. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, it's going to perform at whatever altitude the density altitude is. The gold, let's see, the black airplane had the first string offense and the defense on it. Uh, the gold had the... Uh, second string offense and defense. They had some boosters that paid money uh, into the college and to the football program, and they were allowed to go. The coaching staff and a new coach and their wives and one state representative and his wife were all on the airplane. What they did was not illegal. It was strictly legal all the way through uh, for the most part. They did require some hints or training on some mountain flying, at least sitting down and having a cup of coffee with some instructor that knew what he was talking about. Uh, but it was unknown and never covered on the internet uh, how much of that they had. I would say probably not, none at all. Oh, here's that slide. It's a little bit bigger, but you can see the 13,000s. There's three of those there. And uh, this little notch here is Loveland Pass, 11, 11, 9, 13, 13, and 13. So once they got really past about Georgetown, there was no chance. They were dead. The airplane just flat wouldn't do it. Uh, in the investigation, they interviewed people at Idaho Springs, Georgetown, and all the way up Silver Plume, and all of those people saw the airplane go by. And the only thing that they could say is the nose was up, which would, would be if they were trying to climb, and it was very slow. But it was also very low. There it was were people. down. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It just was not performing at all. And there were people on Loveland Pass that saw the airplane come up, and they were looking down at the airplane. So it was it was not a good not a good thing going at all. Let's see. They had three options coming out of uh, Stapleton. Uh, IFR, which would mean they had to file a flight plan, request an altitude, the controller would give them a clearance and uh, and assign an altitude that would be safe. The controllers are required to have 2,000 feet of terrain clearance between the top of the terrain and the bottom of the airplane. That's mandatory. And this is a mountainous area out here, so the 2,000 feet applied. So if they'd had an instrument flight plan, the controller 
would not have allowed them to go up the canyon until they had the proper altitude first, which would mean circling somewhere over the flatland to get enough altitude to go over the top. They did not file an IFR flight plan. They did not file a VFR flight plan. Uh, they were just doing it strictly on their own. There is another option. The controllers have the option of giving airplanes what they call flight following. And it doesn't mean anything other than that you're talking to somebody that's watching you on radar and whatever they suggest is only a suggestion and they cannot, cannot clear you to a hard altitude that you have to maintain. Uh, you're on your own there. But the issue traffic, weather, and uh, anything else that you might be interested in, they didn't do that. Just a matter of turning the dial on the radio and having somebody to talk to. And if they'd have talked to anybody for any length of time uh, at Denver Radar at Stapleton, uh, they would have probably told them, you know, I've been up there in my car. You don't want to go up that canyon while you're climbing. Get the altitude first. But they never talked to anyone. So strictly VFR, legal. Ron Skipper was flying this leg. Uh, possibly Crocker flew the first leg from Wichita to Stapleton. There was no indication of that. Uh, they got up pretty close to the accident site. This is where the airplane landed. And somewhere in there, probably within maybe a minute before they hit the ground, uh, the uh, co-pilot said to the captain, he said, we should reverse course and gain, gain some altitude. And as soon as he said that, he made a slight right bank uh, to the north and hadn't even gotten back to level yet. And my indication would be that he was trying to get a little further to the north before he started a 180 degree turn to come back. And before he could get that airplane established, the captain said, I've got the airplane. So the first thing you do, turn loose of everything, the captain's got the airplane rolled into a 31 degree bank to the left, added a little back pressure to hold the altitude. The airplane started shuddering and vibrating, which was a good indication of a stall. Not enough air going over the wings to produce the lift. And at that time, they went into the tops of the trees. Just prior to that happening, one of the football players in the right side of the airplane all the way to the front had been looking out the window and saw those trees look like they were awful close. He stepped out of his seat, around the corner, looked into the cockpit. The two of them were talking to each other, and he knew they were busy. And he looked out the front window, and there were trees that were higher than the window of the airplane. He turned around, walked back to his seat, put the buckle on the, the seat belt buckled, and that's when they hit the trees, and he lived. So his curiosity saved his bacon. What else did you do that impact that? Getting to that. <laughs> One o'clock is when they crashed. The mountain was 13, 13 5 there and 13, just over 13,000 here. The altitude that they went into the trees was 10,700. So, not a chance at all. If they had been just a, a shade taller or a shade higher, and maybe I uh, hadn't made such a, 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 a hard bank left turn. Uh, they may have been able to uh, at least come back into the middle of the valley. The valley, the width of the valley at 10-7 between here and the other side uh, was about 3,000 feet, just a shade over a half a mile. That airplane at that speed could not make a 180 within 3,000 feet. They would have had to slow down, put some flaps down, have a whole lot more knowledge about what they were doing. Uh, that did not happen. Did they even know about Loveland Pass being there? I'm not real sure. I've, but, I've flown that through over Loveland Pass and yeah. Cessna and uh, through it. And in that if valley... That, if, you don't make that, if you don't know where it is and you don't make that turn, you get screwed. Yep. And at that, uh, at that altitude, uh, 12,000 feet, um, if they'd have circled a couple of times, they may have been able to get up a little bit, but Loveland was the only option once they got up there. And that was 
was still higher than what they were asking. Right. Now, we talked about uh, we talked about dead city altitude. Uh, good example: Longmont's airport is uh, just a shade over five thousand feet. A good hot summer day of about ninety degrees. The density altitude is eight thousand five hundred. And what that means is, when the airplane takes off from the runway, it thinks that it's at eight thousand five hundred feet, and it's going to perform accordingly. And uh, the density altitude at the crash site, uh, just a wild guess, October, maybe 60 degrees. You figure that out, the density altitude there at the crash site was 13,000. So the airplane was already way behind the eight ball. They hit the trees, four degrees nose down, continued for 425 feet after the initial contact with the trees. Uh, most of the aircraft was destroyed by impact and there was no fire. That allowed nine people to get out of the airplane. Uh, and they were lucky because right after they got out of the airplane it caught fire and the rest of the people that were there died. The first people on the scene, uh, this shows where Interstate 70 goes up and ends right there and it's going into the tunnel. And there were workers there that were working on the tunnel and it was two miles over to the crash site. Uh, they heard it coming up the valley. Some of them stopped and looked at it, like everybody else. An airplane goes by, you have to look at it, especially pilots, Bill, right? Uh, so they were looking at it and then it disappeared into the trees. And then just a few minutes later, there was a fire. So they went from here over there two miles, and this is probably uh, the highway is, I'm going to guess, about nine or 9,500 feet. So for them to run over there, they were pretty exhausted by the time they got over there. And thinking that maybe they could rescue somebody, by the time they got over there, it was a recovery operation and not a rescue. They walked around and helped those people that had gotten out to do whatever they could do while they were waiting for the Alpine Rescue Group to come up. How close to the highway were they? Were they well, there's, uh, there's Interstate 70 right there. So it's just right up the hill? Yeah, so they were probably 1,500 feet above the highway. Oh, okay. when Interstate they Interstate 70 completed that? Pardon? Was Interstate 70 completed that? I'm not sure. If, if it wasn't, it would have been Highway 6. The, the uh, tunnels were built in... Uh, it was opened in 7... It was opened in 73. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. They were, I'm not sure the highway was even in existence. Yeah, there was some way to get the equipment up there because oh, they did, yeah. yeah. Did I, did I push something? There we go. Should I not breathe anymore or uh, or put the mask back on? Here's a, an indication. Now this is a, a poor picture, but it's looking to the west. Uh, I-70, at the wrong pointer. I-70 coming right on up. Tunnel is here. Uh, the road that you turn off to go over Loveland Pass is here. And the crash site was back on this side. This is what uh, somebody took a picture from uh, uh, Loveland Pass, and you can see, actually, thinking back to the fires that we've had here recently, I was really surprised that with 2,000 yeah, 2, gallons of fuel, that it didn't burn more area than it did. But the burn area was pretty well uh, right just around the airplane itself. Looks like there was no wind. Uh, that's true. Uh-huh. Good catch. The Alpine Rescue Group came in to help and uh, put this up because uh, they had a team and they were going to go up for a rescue and it turned out it was just a recovery. Uh, the youngest member of the Alpine team was a 12-year-old boy. He was just getting started. He wanted, loved that kind of work and he wanted to be a volunteer for the rest of his life. 
He was walking around and he found a wallet on the ground, picked it up, opened it, and it was a picture of somebody's family. And that hit him really, really hard. He said that he thought about that and remembered that for the rest of his life. So it was very, very traumatic for him. As the Alpine people and the rest of the uh, workers were up there, this is pretty much what they found. Some of the trees that the airplane hit on the way in. This is the vertical stabilizer, uh, pretty well burned as you can see. And I apologize for these pictures, but they're old and uh, they just don't reproduce real well. These were not COVID masks, but they were wandering around through the debris looking for any sign of life. Uh, here they have uh, someone on a stretcher trying to get them out. And from, from the crash site right straight down to the road was very, very steep. So they had to go back more to the east to find a, an easier way to get down with a stretcher. A lot of trees down, some burning. Uh, here's uh, just an awful lot of debris. Down here in a corner, there's a football helmet and a football shoe. They had found uh, several face masks that were made out of aluminum that had just melted down into a little pile. And the plastic from the helmets, little piles of plastic all over. Another couple of helmets. And there was one that was pretty well burned. There were a couple of them that got through without any, any damage to them at all. Uh, this looks to me like a, uh, an axle from either one of the main gears or possibly the nose gear. So Tracy, there's still debris up there, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. They have never gone up there. Uh, I have pictures of uh, people that have gone up to visit that had relatives that died there, uh, even as late as last year, October the 2nd every year, somebody goes up there, and there's still a lot of debris up there. Uh, amazingly enough, uh, souvenir hunters will go up there and pick up anything that they can to take home, no matter how grisly it is. These were four of the coaches that were on board. Uh, that perished. This was put up uh, later, Wichita State, number 39, uh, Stephen Moore, with his birth date, and that's just sitting there among the wreckage. And you can see just a little bit of everything scattered all over. Here's another one that somebody put up. Uh, they put some rocks on something that was that belonged to somebody else, I guess, just so it wouldn't blow away. One of the helmets that they found that was still in, in pretty decent shape. This guy's name was Vetter, uh, Vetter Sr., and his son uh, was uh, in that accident. So he had gone up there. This is Jack Sr. and Jack Jr. was the one that died there. Uh, you can see that uh, there were some of his uh, personal effects, the camera. Uh, I'm not sure what the rest of these are, but a picture of his son in his uniform. And of course, he's there every October just to go back up and, and visit his son. How much of this... Uh, uh, Bodies and stuff were taken off of the mountain, I'm not sure. Probably all of it. But uh, that was the one that uh, really, really caught my attention. The ones that died, boosters, staff director of admissions, the athletic director, the equipment manager and his trainee, head coach and his wife and another new coach, and the state representative and his wife. Nine survived and two of those died in the hospital. So they wound up with seven, seven deaths, which was really amazing that it wasn't uh, uh, a whole lot more. I'm sorry, seven survivors. 
the black flight landed at Logan, and no one knew anything about the gold flight. There were an awful lot of uh, photographers and news people at the Logan Airport. Uh, they didn't, the people in the airplane didn't know why, just thought maybe it was out to cover for the sports page that the airplane was there with the Wichita State uh, bunch on it. Uh, the airplane, the people all got off of the airplane and somebody went over to the captain and said, we need to talk to these folks, there's been an accident. So very quietly, they put all of the people back on the airplane where they could be informed and sob quietly and uh, because a lot of their good friends were on that other airplane. There was no manifest, so they weren't sure who was on that other airplane. But if you had a good friend and they weren't on the airplane with you, chances are they didn't make it. The National Transportation Safety Board, I'll get to that in a minute. There's uh, another tribute to Jack Vetter. That was on some kind of a tank. Bill, do you recognize the tank? Fuel? Oh, These showed up a couple of years later. And what they were is gold coins that were made in Kansas. And each one of them had a football player's name on it. Uh, a little hard to read. read. Uh, there's Marvin. But they brought a bunch of those up there and didn't scatter them, but placed them around the area where the accident happened. There's some more. And these little notes with uh, the names of the football players on them all over. Uh, those were all left by people that had gone up there to visit. The thing that amazes me, or at least makes me curious, how many of these coins are still up there? How many people would go up there and just pick those up as souvenirs and take them home to show people, look what I got? Uh, really a shame, but uh, you can't change human nature. A little better picture, and you can see the names a little better, but these were all of the, uh, the 14 football players. And it's nice for the families to be able to go up there and look around and find something with their son's name on it. Oop. Somebody had that made out of marble, I think. Took it, packed it all the way up to the top of the hill and put it up there. This was a recent picture of... Uh, Families that had gone up there on October the 2nd and looked around. And uh, you're right, look at the debris that's still up there. Uh, really no reason to haul it off other than aesthetics, I guess. But it does serve as a reminder, and especially if you're a pilot, go up there and find out where they went wrong and what they could have done to save those lives. Down on Interstate 70, you can see this right from the road. Uh, I watch for it every time I go over there, and usually I see it right here as I'm going by, and it's too late to get stopped to go over there. So I've never stopped and visited. The NTSB got involved with this, of course. Uh, National Transportation Safety Board, they call it a GO team. And there are people that are on call, and whoever was on call got assigned to this. Uh, they usually have, uh, oh, probably six or eight people involved. They have an air traffic control, uh, I'd say a specialist, but it's also a subject matter expert, SME. So there's somebody there for air traffic control to check into that, see what the last transmission was at the tower, see if they talked to anybody else on the way up there. Uh, somebody that uh, works at the, the factory where they make the engines. He came in and to look at the engines, see if they're developing power uh, when they hit, see what the instrumentation looked like in the airplane, if they had some of the cockpit left. 
somebody from the FAA that uh, will check on the certification of the airplane, see if it was legal, uh, certifications of the pilots. They have a daily briefing uh, at the end of the day, and everybody shares with the rest of the, the uh, team what they have found out uh, during the day and put all of that information together, and then the agent in charge will assign them duties for the next day. So they really get involved. These were what they found, uh, not the recommendations, but what they found. No failure or malfunction of the aircraft power plants or the flight controls. Can you read that from back there? Okay, good. Uh, this, I thought, was very interesting. 5,190 pounds over max at takeoff at Denver. And still 2,600 pounds overweight at the crash site. Somebody had to know a little bit about uh, weight and balance. Flight plan was altered, which is not illegal, uh, not required that they file a flight plan. Always below the mountaintops. And after dry gulch, there was no turn or no turn or climb was possible at all. So their fate was sealed. And the last one I thought was interesting. Nobody accepted responsibility for the safety of the flight. It all boiled down to the guy in the left seat, the captain. It was his responsibility. So is there major, let's say, legal action? No. I would imagine. Uh, I suppose everybody took a piece of that action, a percentage of whatever the lawsuit was. I never did find anything on the internet about that, though. Uh, of course, Crocker died, but uh, Skipper, uh, he testified at the NTSB hearings. Well, he survived. Uh, pardon? He survived. Yeah, the Skipper. Oh, okay. uh, his name is Skipper, but he was the co-pilot. Right. Yeah, he lived and uh, died years later of natural causes. But uh, Was there any indication that they had filled out a weight and balance? No. No. No, and I think any pilot worth his salt, had they done that at Stapleton, would have said, you know, this is illegal, and it's also dangerous, it's also stupid. Uh, I have two sons that are cops that say stupid is not against the law. Right. I, I was gone for a few minutes. Did you uh, cover their flight experience, the pilots? Uh, didn't have any indication of their, uh, their total times. But there was also no indication of them ever having any kind of mountain checkout or mountain experience in the airplane. So. So you didn't know how much time they had in that aircraft? Pardon? You didn't know? You don't know how much time they had in that aircraft? No, I don't. But they did fly it from Oklahoma City up to Wichita. Uh, who knows? A charter operation, fly by night operation. Uh, it might have been the first time they were ever in the airplane. I don't know. Yeah, it should have been the accident report, right? Or, uh, should, have, should have been the accident report for their time and type. And Probably, yeah. Yeah, because that would be one of the things that the NTSB would be really interested in. But that never showed up on the Internet anywhere either. It sounds like they were a lot of pretty ignorant about the aircraft type. It looked to me like it, yeah. Yeah. Maybe they were bank. Maybe they were just banking on the fact that they could go to twenty nine thousand feet. I don't know. These were the NTSB's recommendations after the investigation. Revise those charter rules. Train the pilots. Make sure they're trained. Uh, either an IFR flight plan and a clearance, or VFR flight follow. Uh, those were the only two options now. You can't go out and do it on your own. Somebody's got to be watching. Management, monitoring all phases, and training in the weight and balance, of course. Does that also apply to private planes? No. No. Nope. How will know anybody with their sole flying in the is going to be doing weight and balance? You should have mountain <laughs> flying in the water. Yeah. <laughs> and Bill, you were, you were mountain qualified, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to teach it even. Yeah. But uh, uh, when they revised the charter rule at that time in 1970, uh, there was FAR, Federal Air Regulation, Part 
121, which regulated the, the uh, scheduled air carriers, the big guys like United Airlines, right. but there was almost nothing that dealt with air taxi and charter yeah. or non-scheduled uh, revenue flights. And so they created FAR Part 135, and it covers all of the things right there. And now, uh, uh, I mean, the, these operators, mom and pop, air taxi and charter, or a, a, a rather large company that, that, that does uh, uh, passenger carrying for hire, uh, has to comply with this. And uh, that didn't even exist in those days. So just like Tracy said, what, uh, this flight, there was nothing illegal about it. You just, if you had an airplane, you bring some people out, charge them money, they get in it, you go. Yep. And uh, all that changed after 1970. When, Bill, when did they adopt Part 135? Uh, in 19, uh, right after this, okay. uh, either 70 or 71. Yeah, Bill was probably too, uh, too modest to mention. But he taught mountain flying. Yeah, I thought he I thought and, he had. That's why I was. Yes, why I and he also <laughs> he also helped build them. Yeah. The mountains. I believe that. Boy, I'll wait. I've got all day. Quick question, Tracy. How many of these aircraft debris fields are there in the state of Colorado? You know, you can get a map on the internet, and I'm not sure what you'd put in for it, but there are hundreds. A lot of them World War II bombers that were training, Lahana, Alliance, uh, uh, North Platte, all of those airports that were strictly for military training. Uh, the uh, The countryside is loaded with them. So it seems like there's one or two added every, uh, every year or two. Yeah. So my, my point is that Colorado was a... Uh, special circumstance for environmental flying. Uh, back in the 90s, I don't know whether you guys remember this, but our governor, I won't say who it was, um, came out publicly in the press and said that Colorado is extremely hazardous to fly over general aviation. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it bothered a lot of us who did this on a daily basis. It bothered us very bad to hear that because uh, those of us who were professional pilots uh, knew that it was not the machinery, it was the, you know, the pilot command. Uh, and this, this is right after he, he had said two things. He says there's two things in Colorado that will down an airplane in the mountains, and that was density altitude or changing of weather patterns, extreme weather patterns and he said that has taken many many pilots down in Colorado yeah. and uh, you can find these crash sites uh, there's there's many of them that are still uh, had debris uh, and every one of them will deal with either this same situation or a weather situation yeah. Yeah. do you guys remember when team flight went down on Mount Blanca Yes. As a kid, it seemed like I grew up down public. I'm trying to remember. Was that? Oh well, my God! I'm getting confused. That was that was a TWA Super Connie. Yeah. Uh, the Blanca. Yeah. There was an airway that ran across southern Colorado, and it had a minimum altitude fairly high, but you could avoid going that high by taking a route that went north, and then turned to go back down to connect with it again. And the TWA, I think it was TWA, uh, they took that route and neglected to turn and right ahead of them was Mount Blanca yeah it was uh, they were hauling uh, Christmas toys and the Christmas toys were all over the top of the mountain down there yeah yeah they were fat dumb and happy and having a good time when they hit the mountain uh, just lack of uh, attention um, uh, Bill what you've flown that route Yes. I've only been, I've only done it once or twice. Twice. I can remember. <laughs> well, there, there's another option. You can go a little bit more. Most of the light aircraft cross the, uh, the, to get over to the western slope, they, they go a little bit north and cross the Corona Pass. Corona Pass. That, that's Corona Pass. that's yeah. quite a bit better. One of my early instructors told me uh, right off of the bat, he said, don't ever go into a canyon climbing 
thinking that you'll be able to top it. He said, you climb out first and going over Corona, I spent a lot of time circling Boulder to get enough altitude. And when the altitude was okay, then I went over Corona and uh, felt a whole lot better doing it that way. But not to go into the mountains climbing, thinking that I'm going to clear Corona Pass. It's, it's pretty up there, but I don't want to see it up close. Does that have where the air density comes? You start getting altitude, it's less air dense. Yeah, the airplane thinks it's a whole lot higher. Right. And, uh, exactly. and it's not going to do you any favors. Adding yeah, curiosity, the 404, what, that was, the Martin 404 was a pressurized airplane. I mean, it, it was a pressurized cabin, correct? I'm sure it was, but I don't know for sure. But those two airplanes had been in commercial service for several years and then upgraded. Is it pressurized? Pardon? It was pressurized. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. What altitude do they require to pressurize? Well, 12, not pressurization, but oxygen above 12.5. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And then pressurization. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and Bill's going to back me up on this. There were some people that were not happy with the findings of the NTSB. I'll let you read that. It says, rest in peace, Danny Crocker. Investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board proved that your boss, Ron Skipper, was the one at the controls, not you. He was not qualified to fly that plane. It was overloaded and flown into a box canyon with no way out. 31 died, but Mr. Skipper survived and put the blame on you. We, the ghosts of that plane, know the truth. Mrs. Crocker What's that? Mrs. Crocker forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> so that wouldn't surprise me that there were some lawsuits that did come out of this, but who knows? Five days after the crash, the lawsuits started. Oh, yeah. Five days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably still in court because it was only 1970. Yeah. <laughs> so now was it Skipper that testified that Crocker's had given the plane? Pardon? Was it Skipper, the one that came out and said that he was trying to make the bang that, that Crocker took over? Yes. Okay, so yeah. it was his word. And yeah, the only survivor up front. Okay. There but were Skipper two. The Skipper was the co-pilot. Yes. Right. Yeah, but Skipper not, makes it. That's not unusual for the, command, for the <coughs> pilot command, the, you know, the yeah. pilot to say, yeah. I've got the aircraft, yeah. they get into extremists. So. Yeah, and it's the final word. Yeah. Yeah. If Skipper thought he was the captain and the pilot in command, why? He would have relinquished it. Yeah. Unless he was an instructor flying in the right seat. Yeah, yeah. but who knows yeah. how much experience they had in that airplane. This is where a voice recorder would have been really helpful. It certainly would. Yeah, yeah. get all of the conversations. Yeah. This is uh, at uh, Wichita State University. It has uh, the uh, names of all of the people who passed away. Crocker's name is the only one I recognize, uh, but that's there on the campus, and the one on the end were the survivors. And they list eight. Didn't they indicate a couple died after they were? Yeah, two of the nine died in the hospital. Are they on that listing? Uh, you know, evidently, since there's eight, I'd say this was put up before that second one died, because uh -huh. there's eight of them here. I'd have to go back and look at the, uh, the list of them. The uh, monument that you just looked at there has sunflowers on it most of the year, Kansas state, state flower. Just for your information, on the back side of the handout you have is instructions of how to find that. I see it, and I never knew what it was. Yeah. Like you say, you didn't yeah. buy it up. I've got a map of it for you here. Yeah. 
before I go to that list, let me go over one other thing here. The, uh, the football players and the staff at the school got together and they decided they needed to vote on whether to continue their football season or not because they had lost so many seniors. Some people thought it would be a slap in the face to those who perished if they did cancel the football season. On October the 11th, the 76 of them voted. It was 75 to 1 to continue the season. Uh, their first game was uh, Arkansas, who was nationally ranked at the time. The game captain for the Logan game was the game captain for the Arkansas game. And he walked to the center of the field on his crutches to uh, acknowledge the fact that he was the captain. Everyone in the stands stood and applauded and cried. Wichita State had three seniors and six juniors. That was all they had left of the first string. So the NCAA allowed freshmen to play for the rest of the games, which I thought was nice. Arkansas won 62 to 10. Uh, Sesta Stadium, there was, that was the, the uh, stadium on the campus. Uh, they had services in the spring of 71. The football uh, program ended in 1986 due to financial troubles. I had a statement here, the board believes that the management required for a safe operation appears to have been absent and was a significant factor in the accident. That's the first page. And a second page. Jack Vetter on the bottom there. There's the memorial, gone but not forgotten. Always flowers up there. This is a map that shows Idaho Springs, Georgetown, Wichita 404 right there. Here's the road that goes up over Loveland Pass. So it is at mile marker once, what did you have on the back of there? 170, 71? 217. This one shows you, if you're familiar with contour lines, that's, these are contour lines, there's so many feet between those. And the closer they get together, the steeper it is. So right here at the parking, it's very steep to go right straight up there because you're starting at about 9,000 feet and it gets worse. And if you're not used to it, uh, they put this in here to show that if you go to the east and come back, it's a little more gradual. So that's where, that's where the airplane wreckage is. 1972, uh, they had a uh, memorial at the stadium. Uh, doesn't look like many people there, but the people are all behind us where the cameras were. And that was the was, uh, Wichita State University crash. May they all rest in peace. Are there any more questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, just, just a comment. this, of course, this reminds me about the same time was the Marshall yeah, it was right after that. In fact, I think that's in the handout. Yeah, yeah, that was ugly too. Yeah, and unnecessary. That was that was weather weather. Yeah. And there's actually a movie that was with Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. One thing I remember uh, from the TV news and the Denver Post after this accident, the NGSB or FAA whatever, went after the black flight too that was sitting over there in Logan. And they, they went all over that airplane, boy. And uh, one thing you didn't mention, the, the aircraft owner was 
Jack Richards in, in uh, Oklahoma City. He was an aircraft dealer. And the Golden Eagle provided the pilots. But uh, th th it was a Jack Richards airplane. And boy, they, they gigged him for a lot of things. One thing they found was the batteries. They uh, typically, uh, a battery for a large aircraft like that is, is oh, it's, it's kind of a cube with maybe the, the edges of a foot or foot and a half. And uh, the battery terminals are on the side, 24 volts. And usually the cables come from the airplane over to a little term of box, sort of, that's got a knob on it. It's, it's a quick disconnect. You put that up to the battery, turn it, and, and you can uh, disconnect it or connect it in a matter of seconds. And then these batteries have to be vented a certain way. And uh, so anyway, they go up and they look at the batteries in this black fly <laughs> and Logan has two car batteries in there wired together, two 12-volt car batteries <laughs> wired in really series of 24 volts. <laughs> and, uh, they, and so that made it uh, uh, unairworthy right there. That was an improved thing. And we yeah. found a few other things like that. Somebody redacted so, that from the internet. <laughs> so, uh, <yeah. laughs> the uh, black flight was overgrossed. And uh, rather than charge the pilot or the pilot in command with that, in lieu of everything else that had happened, they let it drop. Uh, but that airplane was probably taken back to Oak City and put back in service. I think, I think that's all I have for you, folks. Oh, let, let me mention one more thing. The DC-6B that you saw at the first, that's the same type of airplane that was blown up right outside of Longmont in 1955. That's another speech. Well, so we'll, we'll get you back for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tracy, thank you again. And we have now a new challenge coin. Ooh. So we want to give you one of those for the collect your collection, too. But thank you so much yeah. again. It's back it says not, not legal for you, yeah, tender. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, the, oh. yeah. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Yes, everyone. thanks, guys. Sure, you guys don't have any place to go either, do you?